What initially started as a short video about the importance of game preservation, and used the Lost Food Fight prototype as an example, escalated to something far beyond the original scope. While I knew the general story of the film production, I was absolutely not ready for the rabbit hole I plunged down in making this video, so I hope you enjoy watching this as much as I enjoyed making it. Food Fight enjoys a cult classic status in my household. It's one of a very small number of legitimately bad movies that we genuinely enjoy as a family. But the story of production is absolutely mental. It's the story of an up-and-coming company, huge sums of money, corporate espionage, sabotage, and even an investigation by the Secret Service. Or it's the story of one man's complete and utter incompetence. Or maybe something else entirely. Throughout this video, I'll be talking about both the movie and the video game. And that's mostly because it's impossible to talk about the game without talking about the production history of the movie. For anyone unfamiliar with this film, the Reader's Digest version of the official events goes something like this. After three years of work on the animated film, from a studio poised to become the next Pixar, the hard drives containing the entire film were stolen, forcing the studio to miss the projected release date and start the film from scratch. Later, the film lay in purgatory until the assets were auctioned off in 2011, and the film was finally released in 2012 in an unfinished state. It's become legendary because of the estimated $65 million budget, while at the same time being heralded as one of the worst films ever made. But is Food Fight really that bad? In a word, yes. I'll leave a link to a free online copy of the movie downstairs if you want to watch how bad it truly is. Even if you're able to look past the horrendous animation, and it is horrendous, you're still sort of forced to question the ethics of a movie that is basically a brand orgy targeted to kids. It's also hypersexual in a not sexy way, with constant innuendos, the comic relief literally catcalling characters, and the worst offender, puns that would make a three-year-old roll their eyes. Oh, and the plot makes no sense at all. The bad guys are literal Nazis, and there's a huge push of the stereotype that pretty is good and ugly is bad. There's some irony in there, I'm sure. I'm not sure I'd call it the worst movie I've ever seen. I'm not even sure I'd call it the worst animated film I've ever seen. It's definitely the worst animated film with a serious budget I've ever seen, though. So yeah, it's bad. But more than that, it's literally dangerous. One of the motifs of the movie involves our protagonist, Dex Dogtective, getting a boost from eating raisins. Sort of like spinach to Popeye, except in Dex's case, instead of gaining strength, the raisins help him overcome crippling depression so that he can fight another day. Raisins. To date, no toxic agent has been clearly identified, but the potential culprits are mycotoxins, a salicylate drug naturally found in grapes, or potentially tartaric acid. But raisins are toxic and potentially fatal to dogs. As few as four grapes can cause sudden kidney failure even in large dogs if they have a low tolerance. It is absolutely baffling to me that a movie targeted to kids would have such an ill-conceived power-up. I can only imagine a little one feeding their dog grapes after watching this. The only numerical data that I could find was from 2004, where a total of seven dogs died that year due to raisin toxicity. In an alternative universe where Food Fight made its original 2003 deadline, I'd probably be making a video explaining why the grape toxicity numbers in dogs skyrocketed in 2004. Oh, Sunshine Goodness, Dex Dogtective's girlfriend and raisin dealer? She's a cat. Raisins are toxic to cats too, although they're a lot pickier, so I'd imagine it's not a huge issue. Okay, we've got that out of the way. So what I thought was a reasonably straightforward story ended up being so insane I barely know where to start. So I did the rational thing, and I made a timeline. I knew the production of the movie Food Fight was troubled, and now in doing active research I'm only just beginning to understand how troubled it really was. Researching this isn't easy either. Between conflicting data, employees renouncing any affiliation they had with the film, incomplete narratives, and a complete lack of normally credible sources, I visited literally hundreds of websites in order to put together a timeline that makes some sense. No joke. My browser tabs have never looked like this before. In the end, my timeline looks about as muddled as the production itself. But it has proven to be a valuable resource for me when writing this, and it's something I'll come back to often in this video. Realistically, the only way I can make sense of the story is going in chronological order, starting from the conception of the film, and backtracking where necessary. In 1997, after seeing the success of Toy Story, Lawrence Kasanoff, CEO of Threshold Entertainment, and Joshua Wexler, a fellow Threshold employee, conceived a similar story. One that would see recognizable brand mascots come to life after hours in the supermarket. Kasanoff envisioned a cross-promotional heaven, 
one where he would use real name brands in the film, and in return those brands would feature Food Fight logos and original characters on their packaging, the goal being boosting sales from both sides. And to be fair, from a business perspective, this does sound like a great idea. And that makes sense. Lawrence Kasanoff is a businessman. He received his BA from Cornell University, and more importantly his MBA from the Wharton School of Business. He's been involved in the film industry as an executive producer since 1987. But let's quickly talk about what an executive producer does. An executive producer often works at the highest level of production, often raising the majority of the film's money. They typically ensure the film is completed on time, within budget, and to standard. An executive producer is generally the financer of a project, but they will not physically produce the movie. And to Kazanoff's credit, he has an impressive list of films and television to his name. He even co-founded Lightstorm Entertainment in 1990 with James Cameron. That's the production company that brought us Terminator 2, Titanic, and Avatar, just to name a few. I'll get this out of the way now, though. Kasanoff's website hypes the Terminator 2 association like crazy, but it looks like his involvement was primarily marketing, having the credit of executive producer in the television short The Making of Terminator 2 Judgment Day as the only entry in the time that he was with Lightstorm. Kazanoff left Lightstorm in 1993 due to what he called philosophical differences with James Cameron and founded Threshold in the same year. Regardless of whether or not he's padding his resume with T2, the point is he is an accomplished producer and business owner, so you would expect pre-production to go pretty smoothly, and by all accounts it seems to have. Reports suggest that it took two years to work out deals with companies in order to secure the rights to use more than 80 brand mascots. Though silly, brand mascots are serious business. So careful consideration in terms of how they are portrayed is a factor in the development time. During this time, Kazanoff was able to raise $25 million, and I'll explain how I got to that number soon. And studios were interested in the film. Kazanoff is quoted as saying, Every studio but one offered us a deal on the movie, but for us as producers, not for us as the animation studio. And that's a safe bet from those studios. It's better to rely on an established animation host than take a gamble on one with an unproven track record. We're never going to be the next Pixar being for hire producers with some other shop. By the end of 1998, with pre-production finished, Kazanoff's credits were already producer, story writer, one of the screenplay writers, and director. This is where the problems began in my opinion. Film is a collaborative art, and Kazanoff basically gave himself full control. He had enough power that basically anything he said goes. His approach, because he had gotten the money for it and no one could say no to him, was very idiosyncratic. You didn't know from day to day what would occur. Would there be a review? Would he suddenly want to change the whole thing? Don't get me wrong. If a filmmaker has a real passion for the art, full creative control can be a good thing. But when the passion is about the money and not the film, it's destined for failure. With that said, if the final film looked anything like the concept images created during this time, the film probably would have been a success. And as a quick side note, this is Dex. He was originally a human. That takes us to 1999, when the production of the film officially started. A typical workflow during this time has several branches. I won't break down every step here, but at the start of production this is where the assets are created. Concept art and storyboards are referenced, 3D models are rigged, and you start to get a rough idea of what the final film will actually look like. Separately dialogue is recorded and often videotaped so the animators can later reference the videos for extra cues regarding intonation and inflection. So, so far so good. And then in 2000, impressed by the animation and the brand deals, Korean investment firm Natural Image invested an additional $25 million into the project. And this is where I'm getting that initial $25 million figure from. Though initial investment figures don't seem to be available, the number raised during pre-production, most reports I could find suggested that Natural Image matched this initial investment. I know this is an investment firm, but with a name like Natural Image you'd imagine they'd have more than just one film credit to their name. I don't know, maybe it's a shell company with a name more palatable for westerners? Maybe it was created specifically to invest in Food Fight? That might be the most plausible, as I was able to find a list of companies that seem to be involved with them. It looks like Natural Image is backed by Korean companies Filmtree, Hanshin Corporation, and Bixel Media and Color Bank. And Peter Choi, head of the public animation company Hanshin, is president of Natural Image. Aside from that, I can't find any real information on them, aside from the $25 million investment numbers. So unless I'm missing something, we're already looking at a $50 million film. To put this in context, Toy Story, one of the most beloved animated films of all time, had an estimated budget of $30 million. 
Even adjusting for inflation between Toy Story's release in 1995 compared to 2000, it's still only around 34 million. So yeah, Kaznoff had quite the budget to work with. Now extremely confident, the film was announced sometime in 2000, presumably after the additional funds were secured. On May 7, 2001, Food Fight hit its first public snag. Commercial Alert, a non-profit organization whose mission is to keep the commercial culture within its proper sphere and to prevent it from exploiting children and subverting the higher values of family, community, environmental integrity, and democracy, issued a rather damning press release. In it, Gary Ruskin says Food Fight isn't a movie, it's an ad, later calling it a sick and pathetic effort to take advantage of young children for monetary gain. It raises the commercial assault on children to a new level of brazenness. Some people will stoop to any level to make a buck, and sadly, Food Fight is an example. Food Fight looks like a two-hour parade of junk food at a time when we have skyrocketing levels of childhood obesity and type 2 diabetes. Commercial Alert also said it would take a multifaceted approach to urge parents not to take their children to see it. Ouch. Right in the pocketbook. As far as I can find, not much came of this, aside from already commercial aware people recognizing this is an ad that you need to pay for. And nothing has really changed since then. I'm looking at you, Lego Movie. At least that story was awesome though. In any event, the first trailer of the film was published sometime in 2002. Just for fun, let's take a look at the animation of the Food Fight trailer compared to Monsters Incorporated. Chosen because it was released the year prior, has human characters, similar shots, and it's by Pixar. Okay, honestly, there's a difference in style for sure, and the character modeling seems a little sloppier in Food Fight, and Pixar is a clear winner in terms of hair, but for the early 2000s, both are acceptable, and with some finessing, I think Food Fight could have stood its ground with Monsters Incorporated. Not bad. Actually, the more I watch the trailer, I'm starting to think it's just the exaggerated movements that separates these. Deform the Monsters Incorporated characters in a similar way, and I'd imagine you'd see similar results. I'm not going to comment on the content of the trailer though. It's a bad trailer. There's a link downstairs if you want to see what I mean. 2002 seems to be a pretty good year so far for Food Fight. Among the many trademark applications submitted for Food Fight were the trademarks for the game on March 14th and the movie on April 25th. And I'm not joking when I say there is a ton of trademark applications. Plushies, coffee mugs, household products. At this stage you get the impression that Kazanoff truly believes the film will be a massive success, and that it will leave audiences scrambling to the nearest store to get their hands on the merch. But then, in December of 2002, disaster struck. The hard drives containing the film were stolen, and it's estimated that 60% of the film was completed at this stage. Right. So basically, with a deadline looming overhead, the dog ate your homework. This is the point in the story where things get weird. Really weird. Kazanoff is quoted as saying, It was an incredibly complex crime. They got into the cold room. A room, within a room, within a room. Because it was a large-scale theft of intellectual property, the Secret Service took part in the investigation. The crime remains unsolved, and no material has appeared on the black market. Okay. I'm not saying the Secret Service wasn't involved in investigating this, I'm just saying the only mention of it online is from the New York Times article from May 17th, 2004, where they paraphrased that content from Kazanoff's quote. I don't have the tools to actually check Secret Service records. I mean, I checked the US National Archives for Food Fight, and it kept giving me results for Floodlight, so it's either not in the database and it's giving me the next closest result, or there's a bigger conspiracy here than I realize. So let's say that this is unverified. I don't believe it, but it's unverified. A thank goodness threshold was insured for the loss. Oh, come on, Lo-Fi. You're not implying this was insurance fraud, are you? I'm not implying it was just insurance fraud. We're not there yet, though. The other thing about this, and it's because I've worked my entire career in production houses, is I can't believe for a second the backups didn't exist. In my experience, there's two kinds of production houses. Ones with servers, and ones with hard drives scattered throughout the office. You know what both have in common? They back up their work. Every production house has a horror story of losing work because it wasn't backed up. But losing four years of work? 90% of production houses that I've worked for or visited have had three copies of projects. One that's worked on, an in-office backup, and an off-site backup. The other thing that stands out to me here is on projects where you have multiple people working on them simultaneously, that's basically guaranteed to be a server setup, and almost impossible to just steal from an office. 
And just as a side note, I know there could have been renovations between the time that the hard drives were reported stolen and the time these photos were taken, but I really don't see a way that there ever could have been a room within a room within a room. I see a couple of places where a room could have been used as a server room, and that's it. I'm not sure if it's irony or foreshadowing, but when you go to Google Street View for a threshold, this is the first image you see. Honestly, there's just too many red flags. In any event, the film and all of the work involved is gone. So that makes 2003 a pretty quiet year. The only notable date here is the scheduled Christmas 2003 theatrical release was missed because the film was missing. So with no trace of the original film, 2004 marked a new beginning. Production started all over again, but with a catch. Presumably in an effort to make up for lost time, Kaznoff changed direction. Opting to remove much of the unique squash and stretch animation in favor of motion capture. Kenneth Wytrack, a layout artist for the film, would reflect on this change saying, There's a very conscious exaggeration in animation that makes it feel alive. And the mocap didn't work like that. It gave you a first pass of animation, but it wasn't particularly lively. According to the same New York Times article, Kaznoff's main objective in switching primarily to motion capture was because he wanted to direct it more like a live action movie, complete with retakes, motion capture performances, and more spontaneity. As a result, he and the animators were speaking two different languages. It's also around this time that Kazanoff's directorial style would seemingly interfere with the production of the film, requesting things to be more awesome or 30% better. Also during this period, it started to become clear that Kazanoff didn't have a clear understanding of the animation process, not comprehending why a person trained in textures couldn't do the modeling, etc. Though in Kazanoff's defense, the production had recently shifted to using Maya, which is geared towards specialists. The previous software did have this flexibility. It wasn't as tightly structured as I had experienced subsequently in other places. Studios doing large animated features have a defined pipeline, a hierarchy of how shots are launched, reviewed, and approved. The process here was less formal. This time frame also marks the first instance that I could find that the highly sexual nature of the film came into question. I'm not going to go into detail in this section because this plays a bigger role later in the video, but it's reported that as the production wore on, the more overt sexual innuendo began to give staff members pause. McKee Foods even stepped in to put a stop to the comic relief, Daredevil Dan, making cat calls at Little Debbie. Mona Weiss, an animator for the film, said, I thought they're just having fun writing this. It won't make it into the finished film. We'll revisit that sentiment again, but for now, production was back in full swing, and some of the work was being outsourced to House of Moves, a motion capture company, and Image Metrics, which had developed software to sync animation to a voice actor's performance with a limitation. Performers had to stare straight ahead and keep still, which resulted in subdued performances and vacant eyes that often looked in the wrong direction. In spite of the internally tumultuous production, 2005 was a landmark year for Food Fight, and on August 26th, the Food Fight Foundation was incorporated. Let's define what that means before we get too far. Broadly speaking, a foundation is a nonprofit corporation or charitable trust that makes grants to organizations, institutions, or individuals for charitable purchases such as science, education, culture, and religion. There are two types, private foundations and grant-making public charities. Okay, cool. So why does this exist? Honestly, your guess is as good as mine. The only information I could find is that it was registered by Rebecca Walcott, who is listed as president, and it shares the same address as Threshold. Right, so maybe that's not a big deal. But you know what is? Landing an awesome distribution deal with Lionsgate and having Lionsgate help you get your voice artists. Charlie Sheen, Hilary Duff, Wayne Brady, Eva Longoria, Christopher Lloyd, Hang on, that doesn't make sense. The movie was scheduled for a 2003 release date, and we saw the trailer that came out in 2002. Let me check it again. Oh my god. There's four lines of dialogue in the original trailer. And that's another credit for Kaznoff. He plays this character. There's no main character dialogue. Okay, dead serious. What have the animators been working from? Have they just been guessing at timing? Or using a scratch track? And now we find out that the audio was never even recorded at that time. That is just unreal to me. Wow. 
How were you going to make a Christmas 2003 deadline if you still haven't recorded your voiceover in 2005? Alright, let's put that aside for a second and take a look at the cast through 2005 optics. We have our protagonist, Dex Dog Detective, played by Charlie Sheen. He's still early in his two and a half men career, and although there's no such thing as a pre-controversy Charlie Sheen, he has yet to fall out of favor in the court of public opinion. Our damsel in distress, Sunshine Goodness, is voiced by Hilary Duff. She's hot off the heels of Disney's Lizzie McGuire, as well as several movies and her self-titled album. Eva Longoria, a couple of years out of The Young and the Restless and deep into Desperate Housewives, where she won a Teen Choice Award and the People's Choice Award, plays Lady X. Daredevil Dan was played by Wayne Brady of Whose Line Is It Anyway fame, and it's just after hosting his own show, The Wayne Brady Show. And we have Christopher Lloyd, that's Doc Brown and Uncle Fester. You literally can't go wrong with him. I mean, this cast isn't terrible now, but it was good in 2005-2006. For anybody looking into this, you'll see multiple actors playing the same role. The lower build actors are the motion capture actors. I'm bringing this up because initially I wondered if that was the original pre-theft cast, but it's not. Okay, solid cast. Another solid thing? Story Arc invested another 20 million into the film. Story Arc represented investors who gave the funds to Threshold after they caught wind of the Lionsgate deal. So for anybody keeping tabs, by my estimation, this just turned into a $70 million film. That's an impressive year. I should also point out that, unless otherwise noted, when I talk about missed release dates, I'm making an assumption of a Christmas release of that year, based solely on the original 2003 release date. That being said, the 2005 deadline was missed, but we're going to let that one slide since surely Lionsgate would have been aware that the deadline was impossible to make when they were striking a deal with Threshold. The last thing I should mention, and I feel like I'm being generous here, is that the Food Fight game development may have started sometime in 2005. In 2006, there's not a lot of details about the movie production. Realistically, the voice cast must have done the recording sometime in 2006, since the Lionsgate press release was dated October 25th, 2005. Luckily, we have a side road to take here. Sometime between May 10th and May 12th, the only recorded footage of the Food Fight video game was filmed. It was posted on planetquake4.net as part of a larger video covering E3 2006. In the short clip, between kiosks promoting Family Feud and Dora's World Adventure is what looks to be a playable demo for the Food Fight video game. So that's a good sign. It's obviously a tie-in piece to go with the movie. Let's take a look at the poster first. Unfortunately, it's a small part of the frame and the quality of the video isn't great, so there's some room for error here. But there is some information we can find. Obviously, the Food Fight logo itself is clear, followed by the cast, Charlie Sheen, Eva Longoria, Hilary Duff, and Wayne Brady. We can also read on game consoles and in theaters, Spring 2007. A Spring 2007 release date is dangerously close to the GameCube's best before date, and when you remember that both the Wii and the PlayStation 3 came out in November of 2006, even taking into consideration the Wii was backwards compatible, it just doesn't make a lot of business sense to develop a game for expired hardware. Granted, the PlayStation 2 did have a longer shelf life, but the push for gamers will always be towards the current and next-gen hardware. Below that, things are a little difficult to make out. For sure we can make out the PlayStation 2 and GameCube logos. That lines up with the trademark application from 2002. There's no mention of the Game Boy Advance though. I'm not certain, but this looks like it could be the Microsoft logo. So maybe this was going to be for PC as well. I got pretty excited when I saw the T for Teen ESRB rating, because I was under the impression that a game would have to be submitted in order to receive a rating from the ESRB. As it turns out, to obtain a rating, the publisher submits a long-form questionnaire that describes the graphic and extreme content, along with a video demonstrating that content. The questionnaire asks about context, storyline, gameplay, mechanics, reward systems, unlockables, and hidden content, but actually reviewing the game isn't deemed necessary for the rating. So this is a dead end. This might be the Vicious Cycle logo, it's really hard to tell. But it would make sense because they've worked on tie-in software before with Global Star, and speaking of Global Star, they're right here in the bottom right. That one's clear enough that we can be certain. 
Luckily, someone from the subreddit Lost Media already noticed this and emailed Dave Ellis, a Vicious Cycle employee, regarding the game. Dave's response? Hey, got your message from my site. I definitely hadn't heard of that game before, although it does look like an inverted color version of our logo on that screenshot. Hard to tell, though. I checked with Eric Peterson, owner and CEO of Vicious Cycle, and he confirmed that we never had anything to do with a food fight game. After publishing Dora the Explorer with Global Star, we never worked with that publisher again. So if someone was doing a game based on Food Fight, it wasn't with Vicious Cycle. Dave Ellis. Okay, another dead end, maybe. Let's take a look at the footage of the game itself. I've stabilized the footage and corrected the aspect ratio, so I think as terrible as this footage is, it's as good as we're ever going to see unless the game itself is found. Right, so this is clearly a prototype. The surroundings themselves feel like a test level from a template. There's no enemies, and there's a single platform going up and down to interact with. There doesn't really seem to be any level textures either. This is why I said I think I was being generous when I included 2005 in the timeline for the game development window. I think realistically, this is literally just an asset swapped template. I can only imagine how that conversation went. Uh, sir, we haven't started working on the game yet. Whatever, get that f***ing dog looking around at E3. Yeah, it's gonna be huge. You know what this does look really similar to though? A game called Flushed Away. Right down to the design elements of the HUD and how I perceive the gameplay would work. But hey, Dex looks around. So I think realistically this is a media that will remain lost. Depending on the platform and the setup at E3, this was probably played from a burned DVD on a development kit or similar hardware. And if I'm right, there would be no reason to keep a copy of that disc after E3. In my estimates, there's some overlap between the voice recording and the game development, and I'm actually wondering if there was any lines that were recorded specifically for the game. Okay, so that's the story of the E3 footage. But you know what the E3 footage helped me see in a roundabout way? C47 Productions Incorporated isn't in the credits. They're not on the DVD cover either. I'm including C47 here because every online source has them listed as one of the production companies. Threshold, Natural Image, Story Arc, Lionsgate, but no C47. My initial thought was by this time, the credits may have already been done, and since the release of the film was rushed, maybe they weren't updated and C47 was just late to the party. But we know the credits were done sometime between 2007 and 2011, thanks to E3 and a failed marriage. We saw on the game poster at E3 that Eva Longoria is credited as just that, Eva Longoria. In the film, her credit is listed as Eva Longoria Parker. Her marriage to Tony Parker lasted from 2007 to 2011, so the credits must have been done during that time. And this should have been well after C-47's involvement, whatever that may have been. So who are C-47 Productions? Well, they have three shorts and Food Fight to their credit, and that's it. Okay, so who runs the company then? Let's see. Incorporated in 1997, two known addresses, that's Threshold's address. Hang on, who runs this? Rebecca Walcott. That's the president of the Food Fight Foundation. Okay, so there's definitely a Food Fight connection here. Let's check the credits again, for Rebecca Walcott this time. And there she is. She's the accountant. This is starting to look very strange to me. Three organizations. Threshold, the Food Fight Foundation, and C47 Productions all running from the same office, and the connecting fiber is the accountant. Lofi, what are you getting at? As strange as this seems to me, let's move on. The last thing to note is that the deadline for the film's release was not met, again. So let's jump to 2007, where February marked the official discontinuation of the Nintendo GameCube. I see this as the final blow for the Food Fight game. Though I wouldn't consider it a complete failure, the GameCube wasn't exactly a commercial success either, with only 21.74 million units sold worldwide. Put in perspective, the PlayStation 2 sold 158 million units, making it the best-selling console of all time. The crux is the demographic. Sony has always appealed more to an older audience, and Nintendo has more appeal to children, as a general rule. So I'd imagine the lack of potential GameCube sales was a key reason the game was cancelled. I don't think it had anything to do with the quality of the movie. Delays in film production forced a tie-in game into obsolescence, so the spring 2007 release date for the game was missed. Then, another huge blow. 
Lionsgate, growing impatient with the release dates not being met, decided to cut their ties with Threshold. It's unclear whether Lionsgate cut ties before the missed 2007 film deadline or if the missed deadline was the reason they cancelled the deal. Either way, it's a big name to lose, especially when you consider Lionsgate's reach. 2008 and 2009 have conflicting reports. It's unclear whether the film was being worked on at this point or not, but there seems to have been no movement on the film at this time. Something that seems to have stretched into 2010 as well, with one exception. Movie merchandise started showing up in stores. There's no official list, but some of the products spotted in stores were an I Can Find It book, a press and play children's book, and plushies. The confirmed and verified plushies are Dex Dog Detective, Daredevil Dan, Cheezle T Weasel, and a California Raisin. At this stage, I'll take a wild guess and say these probably didn't start showing up because the film was on the horizon. I'm guessing retailers probably had these in their storage rooms for seven or so years and wanted the storage space back. I'll be completely honest here, I dig the art style of the press and play book. So that brings us to 2011. We're on September 26, Food Fight and all collective rights within went up for auction. The Threshold and C47 had defaulted on payments. So that does confirm C47's involvement. Presumably that 70 million was gone. Story Arc, through their agent International Film Guarantors, had invoked a clause in the Fireman's Fund Insurance Company's contract, they were the insurance company for the film, to complete and release the film as inexpensively and as quickly as possible. I think I got that right. It doesn't matter. The point is the same. You know who bid on Food Fight and won? Lionsgate of all companies, I think. Most sources say that. I think it may actually be Boulevard Entertainment from the UK though, which might make more sense when we look at the numbers. It seems like no party involved wants to take ownership and I don't blame them. In any event, it was purchased for a paltry $2.5 million. I think we can stop counting at this stage, but by my calculations that's $72.5 million spent on the film total. On February 6, 2012, C47 Productions Incorporated was voluntarily dissolved, a scant four months before the film's theatrical release. And yes, it did get a theatrical release, albeit a very limited one in the UK on June 16th, as part of a contractual clause. The film didn't have a great run either, even with a stellar cast. Most sources suggest the film grossed around $70,000, but it looks like the official numbers are about $120,000 worldwide. And the UK is the only country reporting their standalone numbers with just under $20,000 from 56 theatres. There's a clip of a localized Russian version playing in theatres too, but no data available for that, so I don't know. Maybe someone was just having fun with her projector and playing their Blu-ray copy. Because that's right, Russia is the only territory to get a Blu-ray release. The rest of us were stuck with DVDs or video on demand, and much later streaming. And while we're on the topic of localizations, there's quite a few. Azerbaijani, Estonian, Finnish, Lithuanian, Persian, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, Ukrainian. No Korean though. Maybe the Korean investors watched the film and thought it wasn't necessary? I don't know, it seems a little strange that Natural Image, with Korean investors, didn't get a localization to me. And just to tidy up some earlier points I used in my timeline, the PlayStation 2 was officially discontinued on January 4th, 2013. Absolute last chance for the game to have surfaced. And the Food Fight Foundation? That was dissolved on December 11th, 2014. So that's the end of the story, right? Well, you know what happens after something is released? People start talking. And under the guise of anonymity, two things can happen. People tell the truth, or they start telling stories. The point is that any random comment online should be taken with a grain of salt. But here's the thing, there's a lot of comments, and they're not really favorable to Lawrence Kazanoff. Let's take a thinking break and look at a few of them. I actually worked on this movie for a bit. It was one of my first jobs in the industry. And let me tell you, if you think it was a train wreck viewing, you should have seen how terrible it was to work on it. The sad truth is, there were plenty of talented people working there. Many of those people moved on to major studios in both film, TV, and games. The bottom line is the director, Larry Kasanoff, is a talentless, classless scumbag that should be banned from Hollywood until the end of time. All the inappropriate innuendos are a direct product of his creative hand. I cannot tell you how many times this moron derailed production with his brainless input, it literally has cost the studio millions of dollars. They eventually stepped in and removed him from the project. Unfortunately, that was a decade and millions of dollars late. I am so ashamed of this movie that I have completely left working there off of my resume. 
On behalf of the many artists that have had the dubious distinction of working on this dumpster fire, I apologize to all of humanity for our part in this. Then there's this thread. Budget breakdown. Actors, $64.8 million. Animation, editing, catering, distribution, rights, $100,000. It's an obvious joke, but the responses don't feel like they are. You forgot the $7 million that Larry Kasanoff pocketed during that time period. Source, I worked there during it. Probably not the best throwaway to use for this, but it's true. He burned down his Malibu mansion using floodlights for motion capture research and made bank on the, the insurance payouts and killed the project three times during production to get new investors. The only reason the film was released was because the bank took over Threshold Animation after they failed to meet the deadlines for the release and sold the movie rights to a UK company. The same Reddit user also says, The hard drives was the server room, which is kept behind a giant locked door that very few people have access to, and logs are kept whenever the door is opened and by whom opened it. They were never stolen, they were deleted intentionally. The original movie, written by Josh Wexler, was actually a good children's movie. Then Larry seized control of the creative development of it and turned it into the perverted sh** you see now. And you know what? I believe that Reddit user. It lines up with the comments from Kenneth Wyatrack and Mona Weiss, who did go on record. I worked for this tool a few years ago. I say tool because to use a thing's real name has power. Everyone can say what they want to about his valiant efforts. But he was a tourist, completely uninterested in animation and only doing it to make a quick buck. And because he thought it would be easy, he was a joke. The studio was a joke, and I seriously doubt that his animators and other artists got paid well at all. It is this type of a poser that makes the animation business so hard to deal with these days. There's at least one at every studio. I was unfortunately one of the abused artists working on the film. From the dungeon of a studio, there's a certain producer slash director slash writer slash hack with no talent who was the sole reason for this movie crashing and burning. He had no concept of how to direct animation and made us redo stuff different ways. That was done so many times I couldn't count. There were amazing talented artists working on graphics and animation in there, and everything that looked decent and true to the brand characters, he would change until it was beyond recognition from where it started in the worst possible way. I could go on and on all day. Every day was a new disaster brought on by incompetence on the part of the director. Meetings were a disaster and directed by the musings of a madman who also made me clean up his dog's diarrhea. I was hired to do one thing that I did very well, and after some time I was switched at his direction out of the blue for no reason other than pure whimsy to do something completely different that I had no knowledge of how to do, and I was given no training and had to figure it out myself. Then he came two weeks later and asked me why I was doing such a crappy job compared to the specialists who have been doing it for years as their career. When I explained to him that this wasn't what I was hired to do, and I had to learn from scratch with no help, he asked me what the difference was. Being the director, he should know that difference. But I think in his mind, everyone who works in animation can do everything perfectly, from modeling to texturing, rigging, lighting, and animating. So he could randomly assign anyone to any job despite job titles and specialties, and they would execute it perfectly. The result is that trailer, and probably less than an hour of footage that Threshold claims is a finished movie. I was working at Threshold back in 2001, and they were talking about this so-called film back then. The creators went out of their way to say it was strictly a money-making device, thinking food companies would jump at the chance for free advertising. I actually worked on this film. Sh talking aside, here's the thing. Yes, Threshold was a monster. Yes, there were rumors flying about how terrible the owner guy was, like we're talking fake auditions for commercials and casting couch. Terrible type of sh so again, these are random comments from various web pages. Not exactly the most reliable source, but there's definitely a common theme, and I'm inclined to believe most of what's written there. Not everything, though. Someone literally wrote a creepypasta about the film production, so you can't believe everything you read. But when we put everything together, why did the film fail? I'll explore four options. Option 1. The official story is truthful and was plagued by a series of unfortunate events. For this theory to work, we have to make a few assumptions. Namely, the missing data in my timeline will help explain why this story seems so strange. We also have to assume that it was actually possible to steal equipment from the server room. And if we do make these assumptions, this really is the story of a second chance and complete incompetence. Option 2. This was an insurance fraud scheme. 
This implies that Kaznoff, at some point early in the production, knew he wouldn't be able to deliver on what he'd promised. He deleted or otherwise removed the original work print of the film to get the insurance money and cover up the film's progression. If this is the case, he would have known he would still need to deliver the film at some point. Option 3. This was a money laundering scheme. This pops up often in discussions about food fight. In this scenario, money comes into threshold, they clean it through the film, and assumed they would still be able to make the film in order to not raise suspicions. Honestly, even after going through everything I can find, none of these seem impossible. But I think option 4 fits the best. Option 4 is a combination of the first three options. I'm imagining a writing eager Kazanoff who did have a real vision at the beginning of this project. Not so much a vision of a film with artistic merit, but a vision nonetheless. I think Kazanoff couldn't care less about the story, only seeing brand deals and partnerships, but he believed in the film. It really feels like some of the initial money from pre-production was pocketed, or at the very least underreported. And although I have no concrete proof, the natural image deal feels very off. Remember that creepypasta I offhandedly mentioned earlier? One thing I didn't mention was that there's enough details about the real production in there that I get the impression whoever wrote it really did work on the film. This is a snippet from their story, and one that I think holds a little weight. And where did he get that money? Well, some of it was actually from the brands foolish enough to agree to the movie. But a lot of it came from offshore investors. Which leads me to my second point. Someone was funding this movie in secret. I never heard exactly who it was. My friend who worked as a layout artist said it was the investor from Korea. So I'm not convinced that this wasn't money laundering. Again, no proof though. But if it was, the Food Fight Foundation could have been the perfect guys to funnel the money. I think by the Christmas 2003 deadline, Kazanoff saw his project was nothing like what he promised, and removed the work print himself in order to buy more time, get extra funding from the insurance company, continue working out more brand deals, and have a reason to start fresh. Having no concept of the medium, I think he mistakenly saw motion capture as an easy out that would save him time and millions. And in the end, I think for Kazanoff at least, it was actually more profitable to continue working on the movie rather than releasing it. I mean, the money kept coming in, regardless of whether he had anything to show for it or not. No matter what the real story is, it's weird. There's probably never going to be another film like this in my lifetime. And that alone makes it worth a watch, because sometimes the history, the theories, and the unknowns make a thing worth investing your time into, even if it's just for curiosity's sake. Thank you for watching. All video sources are listed within the video itself. Stock video and images are from Pexels.com. All sound effects and music are from freesound.org. Research, script, voiceover, and editing are done by Lo-Fi. Additional voices are AI generated using voice copy. Recipe book.